Last, uh, last month, I took a Friday off of work, and uh, my wife Stacy and I had plans to take our sons, Tanner and Jacob, up north to go camping. And uh, the, unfortunately, the trip got canceled. Our reservations were canceled because there were forest fires up there. It was really bad, um, so we couldn't go. So, so we were faced with, what, what do we do? The forecast is going to be 108 degrees. It's a, it's a Friday. We have, the, we have time off work. We want to spend some family time together. And we thought, what's a, what's a better way to cool off than to go to the water park? Six Flags Hurricane Harbor, right? If you think about it, even the name is meant to cause fear, right? <laughs> they have this ride there called the Tornado. Ooh. And there was a lot of waiting and anticipation. And in 100-degree weather, we stood there in line and we watched others screaming down this water slide. And, and, and to picture this, picture an upside-down cone, almost, almost like a, a half of a funnel, if you will, right? That's, that's the ride. So when it's our turn, we all get up to the top, the four of us, we all have to climb into this life raft, this, this round rubber life raft. And we're, we're sitting and we're facing one another in the life raft, and we hang on for dear life, right? And they send us down this steep chute, so we start picking up speed. And then your life raft just drops. I mean, you drop into this funnel and you're weightless. I was backwards, you know, and so I'm looking up at my family and with terror on my face, we're dropping down into this, uh, this funnel and you shoot up to the other side. And then you're looking down on everyone in the life raft and, and you're weightless for a second and you hang on and it's just a millisecond and then whoo, down again, picking up speed to the other side and back and forth and back and forth until you get down to the exit and you go out into a nice calm pool of water. It's frightening, you know, and, and yet it's thrilling, right? And it's fearful. And yet I, I love it. I love it. I would totally do it again. I love the thrill rides. We waited 30 to 40 minutes for probably a three, 30 second, three minute ride, you know, and it's so fun. Well, today we are talking about fear. Not, not like the fear of, ooh, Moorhead's preaching today. Uh, I'm afraid of what that's going to mean. No, that's valid, but no, no, we're talking about the fear of God. Right? Fear of the Lord, fear of Yahweh. And it's an important topic because the fear of God is found all over the Bible. Not, not but just a few weeks back, we finished a whole series on Ecclesiastes and the, the summation of that series was the whole duty of man is to fear God and keep his commandments. I mean, Proverbs, the wisdom of Proverbs is founded on the fear of God. It's all over there. And even in Revelation, we see the con those who conquered the beast singing to God about the fear of God. They're doing this in heaven. That's kind of mysterious, but it's all over. Now, now, this is the ninth sermon in our DNA series. That we've been exploring what it means uh, at Grace Church, what our culture is like, what defines us as a, as a church and makes us unique. And all of the teachings from this series tease out how we fulfill our purpose, which you hear quite often of spreading the joy of treasuring Christ in all of life. Now, take a look at the, this banner behind me for a second. As a church, we put the gospel at the, the heart of everything we do. And those four value statements up here represent how we think about gospel centrality. Right? The fear of God is part of our DNA series because worship without the fear of God becomes untethered from love. And it becomes stiff. Community gets shaped by the fear of man, right? Oh, I don't want to let anybody down. Your mission can start to be driven out of slavish obedience. Right? Well, God said go, so we've got to do something. And people, without the fear of God, will become drenched in joyless servitude. Right? Have you ever heard this? Don't suck the life out of the church. Serve in children's ministry. Joyless servitude. 
Let me ask you, what comes to your mind when you hear the word or the phrase, the fear of God? What if I told you that the fear of the Lord may, may not be what you think it is? Fear, like other words in the English language, can take on a lot of different meanings. For example, the word love. Now, let's talk about the elephant in the room, right? Last night was rough, if you're a Suns fan. It was rough. I, lo- I love the Suns. I love watching. Our family loves watching the Suns in the final. But, uh, you know, Drew stealing that ball and alley-ooping it up to Giannis was just devastating. And, man, I- I've, be- I've begun to now doubt for the first time whether or not they can actually win. I- I'm sorry to say that, but... Um, I'm doubting, you know, and that aside, right, we have enjoyed the Suns. I I love the Suns, and I love Suns basketball. I love my family, too, and I love God, like this this t-shirt sort of uh, exemplifies, right? But see how we overload the word love? Certainly, I don't love the Suns in the same way that I love my wife, Stacy. The word love takes on different meanings depending on the object, of that love, and fear is the same way. Let me show you what I mean. Here are two familiar passages from the Bible about fear that challenge our understanding of what right fear of God actually is. First is from 1 John 4, 18. Familiar to most of us, right? There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Wonderful promise. And then second is Romans 11.20. You stand fast through faith, so do not become proud, but fear. Okay, what's going on here? Now we're commanded to fear, but love casts out fear. So why isn't this an example of the Bible contradicting itself? Well, just as we saw how the, love wor- the word love takes on different meanings, depending on its object, the fear that John rightly tells us to cast out by love is not the same fear as the fear of Romans 11 that we're commanded to have through the humility of faith. Not the same fear. Isn't this true that as a society, we enjoy unprecedented safety and health in in the history of mankind, and yet we're more riddled with fear and anxiety than ever before? Right? According to the Anxiety and Depression Association of America, yes, that is a thing, anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S. Panic disorder affects 2.7% of the population. Social anxiety disorder affects 6.8%. Major depressive disorder is the leading cause of disability in the U.S. for ages 15 to 44. That's astounding. And and last week at work in a meeting, I heard this. I heard that in 2020, anxiety amongst workers increased 80%. That's astounding. Why do we have such a proliferation of undesirable fears? Could it be, just maybe, that we're so struck with this type of fear because we've lost sight of the right fear? When you think about the fear of God, do you envision a cosmic vigilante waiting to smite you when you step out of line? Or perhaps you view the fear of the Lord more of an Old Testament concept that means nothing more than reverence or awe. What if I were to tell you something's missing from that view? What if I were to tell you that the fear of God is not a groveling, dreadful reverence? Well, hang on, because in about five minutes, we're going to see what the Bible has to say that is the missing component from that view of the fear of God. Christian author Michael Reeves said this in his book, Rejoice and Tremble. He said, I want you to rejoice in this strange paradox that the gospel both frees us from fear and gives us fear. 
It frees us from our crippling fears, giving us instead a most delightful, happy, and wonderful fear. If that's challenging for you to embrace, that's okay. But what if Michael Reeves is right and God wants to free you from your fears and give you delight by replacing that fear with a right fear? The point I want to make this morning is this. The right fear of the right God leads us to the right heart. The right fear, the right God leads to the right heart. And my aim is to let Scripture make this point for us. To do that, we're going to look at a chapter in the Bible that, you, that might not be the most obvious place to start when you're talking about fear. We're looking at a psalm about the steadfast love of the Lord. Take a look for, with me at Psalm 33. And we're going to see that right fear of the Lord is found at the intersection of two truths about God. Starting in verse 1. Shout for joy in the Lord, O you righteous. Praise befits the upright. Give thanks to the Lord with the lyre. Make melody to him with the harp of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play skillfully on the strings with loud shouts. Now, music and singing is an extremely prevalent part of Christianity. We're a people who expresses our beliefs through song more than any other religion in the world. And this is because of the character of the God that we serve, the God that we fear. The psalmist opens his song about the steadfast love of the Lord with a call to praise him through song, much as we have done this morning in the opening of our time together. Great is the Lord, we sang. And he is. Verse 4. For the word of the Lord is upright, and all his work is done in faithfulness. He loves righteousness and justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the waters of the sea as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let's pause for a second there. Almighty God holds the only power in the universe to create from nothing. All of his creatures who are creative must start with the raw materials that God has already created himself. Right? Think about the bird. The bird builds her nest from sticks and grass that God caused to grow. The chimpanzee who stacks crates to reach a banana is creating stairs from something made by a human using materials that God created. And the SpaceX engineer who designs an incredibly advanced reusable rocket booster that uses artificial intelligence to land itself back on Earth upright on a tiny platform floating in the middle of the ocean, nonetheless is unable to create any of that without depending entirely on what God has already created, including the very laws of physics and math that enable that to work. There is an all-powerful God, creator God, and everything starts with our God. It comes from our God. He simply speaks by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, and it comes into existence. Pondering this amazing creator, the psalmist has a word of instruction for us. Back to Psalm 33 in verse 8. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke, and it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. The Lord brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He frustrates the plans of the peoples. The counsel of the Lord stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. The psalmist here is telling us the plain truth about God. 
He's creator. And because he's creator, he should be feared. In fact, we're told who should fear God. Psalm 33 instructs that all the earth ought to fear the Lord. Everyone should stand in awe of him. Everyone should fear the Lord as creator. Everyone. God is the ultimate creator, commander, counselor, planner, blesser, heritage chooser in all of the universe. We're insignificant dust. He is the very definition of power and meaning and life itself. He's awesome because of who he is, upright, full of steadfast love, lover of righteousness and justice. And he's awesome for what he does, speaking us into existence, faithfully working for our good, providing his word on what is right, judging the nations who selfishly seek after gods of their own making, graciously choosing a people to receive his forever blessing as a heritage. That is heavy. That is heavy. Fear the creator. He's awesome. We should stand in awe of him. It's awe and wonder. But if you stop with that one truth about God, you only have half of the equation. It's like trying to make table salt with only sodium. It's not sodium chloride without the chloride too, right? So if you stop at reverent awe of an awesome creator God, If you stop there, you'll fear an impersonal God. But that is not the right God. A half-baked knowledge of God might leave you thinking he's a harsh taskmaster. And this is where I'd like to step out of the way and let Jesus give you an example of what this looks like. The lazy servant in the parable of the talents. You guys remember the parable of the talents in Matthew 25? We read about this master, and he uh, is going away. And so he entrusts three of his servants with his talents. And uh, upon his return, the one who was given the least amount, a single talent, he was called by the master to show what he had done with, with what he was given. And the servant said this, Master, I knew you to be a hard man reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scatter no seed. So I was afraid. And I went and hid your talent in the ground. Here, have what's yours. The master was not pleased with this servant. And neither will God be pleased with you or me if we hide from him because we have a groveling, slavish, works-based fear that causes you to squander away the raw materials that the creator has given you to create with. The servant in Jesus' parable did not have the right fear of God. Another another error that comes from a half-baked knowledge of God might fill you with the fear of judgment. If seeing the creator God as your judge, which he is, but if that's the only way that you are able to see God you'll end up hating him because there's nowhere on earth that you can go to escape his sovereign judgment and there's no amount of good works that you can do that will prevent him from seeing right past your veneer of I'm a good person and straight into the true state of your heart where you have made a kingdom unto yourself. This is Apollo. This is David and Abby's dog. Pretend for a minute that Apollo is a vicious guard dog. He's not. He's, he's more like a big teddy bear, but pretend for a second. Now, if Apollo belongs to someone who's your enemy and you start to run away, it's terrifying to think about him releasing this large, vicious dog. But on the other hand, if you're Abby and Apollo loves you, and is your protector, and someone is approaching you who means to harm you, you'll feel feel a whole lot more protected having that dog guard you. Pastor John Piper put it this way. He said, God is horrifically dangerous to run away from, and we should be terrified to run away from God. But if we will stay with him 
His growl is a growl of our protection, not our destruction. So if you find yourself putting forth tremendous effort to obey God in order to avoid bad things happening to you, you may not have the right fear of God. If you have the slightest dependence upon your own good works, you may not have the right fear of God. If you dread the punishment of hell, but not sin itself, you may not have the right fear of God. If you tremble at the thought that God is a righteous judge, good, so do the demons. You may not have the right fear of God if that's where it stops. And all of these are examples of running away from God. Okay, now this raises a really good question. If the fear of God isn't just awe and trembling at a sovereign creator God, what are we missing from our view of God in order to get the right fear and the right heart? Well, once again, let's let the Bible show us the answer. Because God is not only creator, but also redeemer. Let's look at verse 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen as his heritage. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees all the children of man. From where he sits enthroned, he looks out on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all and observes all their deeds. The king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. And by its great might, it cannot rescue. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his steadfast love, that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. Did you notice the change of focus that started in verse 12? We previously saw God's posture toward all the earth, and now we see that there is a special people. For example, in verse 13, God sees everything done by all people, the children of man, also in verse 15, his, in his sovereignty, he shapes the hearts of all people. But when we see in verse 18, the eye of the Lord, it refers to a special, intimate way in which he knows some people more than others. Much in the same way that we pray for God's presence to be with us, even though we know he's omnipresent, right? His eye is on certain people in a way that's different from his broad view of all people. Think about a dad whose children are in a school play. Jack and the Beanstalk. He sits and he watches all the kids. He sees the boy that plays Jack. He sees the, the girl that plays Jack's mother. He sees the children in the village and the one who sells Jack the magic beans. He sees the child who plays the giant. And then... And then his eye, though, his eye, though, is not on them, right? Because he sees this little girl who plays the golden goose. And he watches that girl with a smile and a joy and love. Why is that golden girl, golden, golden goose girl different? Obviously, it's because that's his own daughter. He's looking on her in a special way, but he sees everything. And this is how God looks on his own children. His eye is on those who fear him, who hope in his steadfast love, says the psalmist. These are the same people, his children, in verse 12, quote, whom he has chosen as his heritage. And what heritage might that be? The answer in verse 19 proclaims that he may deliver their soul from death and keep them alive in famine. You see, the right fear of God acknowledges this additional truth about God. His children fear the Lord as compassionate Father and merciful Redeemer. Both 
parts of the equation together. This is the truth that closes the circle on our understanding about the fear of the Lord. To, to have the right fear of God, we must see God not only as creator, but also as compassionate father and merciful redeemer. When, when we rode the tornado at Hurricane Harbor, uh, had we not known that it was safe, had we not seen others enjoying the ride, if we did not understand that the life within the life raft, within the life raft we were protected, right? That ride would have been terrifying to us. Thrill rides, they, they tow the line between our natural sense of terror at the prospect of pain and death and our rational understanding that in truth, all the safety measures are in place to keep us safe so long as we stay within the life raft. But from that position of safety in the life raft, our fear turns into joy and thrill and exultation. You see where I'm going? Right fear of God is joyful, thrilling, exalting, freeing, reverent, awe-filled, hope-saturated, and love-amplifying. Yes, I did say love. If that's a sticking point for you, that the fear of the Lord and the love for the Lord are complementary, that's okay. You just learned something very important. Love and fear in the Bible are not opponents who square off in to do battle. It's more like true love for God and true fear of God, our allies, working together to shape our affections and our actions. The right fear of the Lord does not cause us to run from God, but rather... It propels us toward the safety of our compassionate Father who loves us. It causes us to get in the life raft. Charles Spurgeon explained it this way. He said, it is not because we are afraid of him, but because we delight in him that we fear before him. Thine heart shall fear and be enlarged, says the prophet Isaiah, and so it comes to pass with us. The more we fear the Lord, the more we love him. Until this becomes to us the true fear of God. To love him with all of our heart and mind and soul and strength. The right fear of the right God leads to the right heart. Now in Deuteronomy chapter 6, just before giving that commandment we just heard... Jesus, what Jesus called the greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, all your strength. Moses said that the Lord's commandments were being given that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son. Fear and love. And this is also why John Newton in his hymn, Amazing Grace, could write this seemingly paradoxical line, "'Twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved." The grace that Newton speaks of, that's the ticket to get us in the life raft. In order to find ourselves no longer running from God out of fear, but propelled by the fear of God towards our compassionate Father, we must first become his adopted child. And guys, there's only one way into his family. Ephesians 1 lays this out for us very clearly. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. This, this is really important. Jesus Christ is that life raft. God becomes your merciful redeemer. In Christ, you're adopted, and God becomes your compassionate father. When you're in Christ, fear can go from a simple dread of punishment to a right fear of the Lord that is re held by sin and propels us toward him. 
Jesus makes it possible for a sinner like me to go from dreadful fear and anxiety to a fear that both trembles and rejoices at the same time. All right, we've covered a lot of ground so far. We've learned that the right fear of the Lord means knowing God as creator, righteous judge, and it also means knowing God as our compassionate father through adoption, by adoption through Jesus Christ, our redeemer. So, this week, here's what I want you to do. First, stop running from God and get in a life raft. What's preventing you from seeking the forgiveness of God? Well, would you allow us, the people in this room, to help you work through that? Don't delay. This is your invitation to put aside whatever it is that you're afraid of and put your faith in Jesus Christ if you've never done that. Some of you have done that, but you've forgotten that you're already in the safety of the life raft. If you're in Christ, the eye of the Lord is on you. He's your compassionate Father. He's watching what you're doing with love. Why are you still running away from Him? Stop. God does not delight in punishing you. He's gentle and he's lowly, and He delights in forgiving you. Getting in the life raft means that the threat of hell of eternal damnation, has been taken away. But your desire to obey God and turn from sin remains. You're free. So let your soul long to be conformed to His holiness. A right fear of God accelerates our love for God. Second, live a genuinely Christian life. By genuinely Christian, I mean to draw a contrast with living a life that appears to be pious on the outside, but is actually just hypocritical and unacceptable to God. To put it in the negative, don't be religious for self-centered reasons. Fear reigns in self-centeredness. John Bunyan spoke of the fear of the Lord as a Christian's, quote, highest duty. He called fear not only a duty in itself, but as it were, the salt that seasoneth every duty. For there is no duty performed by us that can be by any means be accepted of God if it not be seasoned with godly fear. So this week, as you lean into the Redeemer with a joyful, loving fear Let that affection spill over into praise and faith, gratitude and trust, worship and good works. Do the work that God prepared in advance for you to do, but do it with trembling and joy. And lastly, trust God with hope-filled waiting. John Calvin said that the knowledge of God set forth for us in Scripture invites us to first fear God and then to trust in Him. And this is exactly where our psalmist goes next. In verse 20, he says, our soul waits for the Lord. In in verse 21, he says, we trust in His holy name. So wait on God to justify you. Wait on him to rescue you. Wait on him to protect you. Wait on him with expectation and trust and brokenness. Your father will redeem you. He won't forget his own children. He will save you from death so you can worship him with trembling and rejoicing. All right, as I bring this to a close, give me just another minute of your attention, please. I want you to think what life could be like. If we live with the right fear of the right God, life will be like the thrill of being in the safety of that life raft, right? Imagine how our world would change if we leaned into God instead of running away from Him. If we trusted God instead of being scared and anxious. If we obeyed God out of an overflow of love and not to earn his favor. 
Imagine if we, as Christ's followers, lived with the right fear of God. We would be the most secure people on the planet. We would develop a reputation in our community as a church filled with peaceful, anxiety-free people. If, if we get this right, the fear of the Lord, our prayers will be packed with the eager expectation of a child asking their gracious father to do what he already loves to do. Our neighbors will become shocked at how much good we do and, and how happy we are doing it. It's the fear of the, the Lord that does that. People who don't believe will want what we have and we would tell them without worry or fear of rejection of the love of our merciful Father and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who wants to give them eternal joy. Let's cry out to God now with the pleading of the psalmist who ended his song with this in verse 22. Let your steadfast love, O Lord, be upon us, even as we hope in you. Merciful Father in heaven, this is our prayer, that your steadfast love would be upon us, that we would hope in you. We know you as almighty creator, and we are in reverent awe of you. And we admit that sometimes we stop there and we fail to know you in your fullness. Forgive us, Lord, for living uh, in the fear of man. Forgive us for living in fear of dread and dread of punishment and in doubt of our salvation in your Son. We are weak in faith and we fall into the trap of running from you instead of running towards you. We know that you are our compassionate Father, and that Jesus Christ, your Son, came in the flesh. That He came from you. That He is God. You are a God of abundant goodness and steadfast love. Your mercy is new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Thank you for adopting us as your own. Thank you for loving us when we were your enemies. Blessed are you, O oh God. Lord, give us a healthy sense of the right fear of the Lord, not a slavish fear that only fears punishment. Instead, give us a fear of a child who longs to please their father. We know your eye is upon us. Give us a fear of you in the right knowledge of who you are. Awesome creator, righteous judge, merciful redeemer, compassionate father. We want to love one another, to love you without fear of punishment, to love you by obeying your commands. And your word instructs us that the fear of the Lord is the beginning of the knowledge of the Holy One and of salvation. We want to receive your instruction. Would you teach us to fear, Lord? the fear that complements true love for you? Merciful Redeemer, we pray you would give us a right heart. We long to be conformed to your image, to be humbled, to strive towards holiness in the fear of God. Make us into a church that exemplifies the right fear of God as an expression of love that propels us towards you. Lord, prepare, prepare us for that. And we ask now that you would prepare our hearts to enter into communion with you. This, all of this we ask in the precious name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.